special guest. He is the director of the Addiction Prevention Coalition. He's the county commissioner here at Shelby County, and he's also my father. So, um, yeah, Mike, Dad, how's it going? Good, thank you. Good, good in. son, good son. I really appreciate all the snacks you had in the dressing room for me. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, was, we 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 uh, had the full layout going mm -hmm. for you there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, I gotta admit, this is more of a difficult interview because I can't be like. So you tell me you've been married for. 19 years because I already know that it's like, you know, it's it's difficult for me to do so we're just gonna We're gonna roll with this one and, and talk through some stuff um, so First of all you work at Addiction Prevention Coalition. That's right. Um, so so tell us About that tell yeah. Well, I became the executive director about two years ago and our organization helps folks who are addicted uh, find treatment for free we're in 12 different schools across the, the Birmingham area uh, with peer-to-peer -peer groups called in focus groups. Uh, we have preventive partners programs. Uh, our, our most enjoyable thing that we do is the annual in heroin Beham walk. Uh, we normally do that the last three years at Railroad Park, but this year we're going to do it at Valladale Road at, at Veterans Park. And each year we have about 3,500 plus come out each year to the walk. And uh, so the funding that we raise from that strictly goes to helping scholarship people who have an addiction get into a treatment or rehab facility for free. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. And um, so you're just basically a resource for anyone that doesn't really know what to do and can go into. To... We've gotten over 150 calls this year alone and have helped 70 people get into rehab facilities at no cost to them. So that's awesome. what we, we love, enjoy doing that because everybody needs a, some help every now and then. It's really cool. Yep. Um, and not only that, but you do county commission work. Um, so what do, what sort of um, are y'all's key points to y'all, you know, move around here in the show in the county? Well, we have nine commissioners and we have districts in those commissions. Uh, my district is on the north side of Valladolid Road, which is I always say the Jefferson State Community College side of, of Valladolid Road from to River Chase to 280, and yeah. to where Jefferson and Shelby County meet. Uh, we all have um, uh, a great county management system. We have uh, a great county manager, a, a great director of development, chief engineer. Uh, those guys make all of us part-time county commissioners look good, and we do everything from paving roads to buying flip-flops for the jail inmates. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. So um, you work with like some a lot of people that are in charge of the county around mm -hmm. here um, yep. Lewis Brooks who was just here a few yep. weeks ago with us um, so tell me about that what are what are the people like that you work with you know we we get along there's no body that ever has a, a bad word to say in our commission in our team at Shelby County uh, we do it the right way we're good stewards of funding because you know every dollar goes to certain things like Oak Mountain High School trails or we're paving we're helping pave the Oak Mountain State Park from all the way from one end to the other you'll see new bike lanes out there at Oak Mountain State Park everything you see out there that's been done we've written a federal grant for and gotten some funding for it and and uh, so I kind of love the, the Oak Mountain area because of uh, all the things that used to be you walk out there it was real old and afraid to walk on the wooden Platforms and now we've done all that stuff and made it brand new for everybody. So, you know, really we're cool. excited about that. It's awesome. It's just a good place for everyone to go um, and Just want to talk about the, how you grew up um, You grew up in, in a fatherless home. Um, so what what was that like what what? Um, just was growing up like you know that? I grew up in the western part of Birmingham and my dad left in 1975 when I was eight and a half years old so Back in the day at that age, you really didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize it until later that we were the only divorced family in that whole neighborhood of about three or four block radius. Uh, I didn't know we didn't have any money. I didn't know we were poor. You know, all I knew was I was outside riding a bike. I was right, running up and down the railroad tracks, going to the boys club, playing little league sports, riding my bike to the park, riding at home, uh, climbing trees. You know, you name it, we did it. We didn't have cable back in the day, so uh, a lot of people did, but we didn't. Uh, I received toys for tot and I received food stamps my mom did and we, we we had free lunches all through my high school career but um, one time a little uh, when my mom went and picked up some toys for tots things I had a little football in there and uh, I kicked that football until the rubber came out of it and then I pumped it up again and I kicked it again and wound up getting an athletic scholarship because somebody thought enough to give to toys for tots and provide an at-risk fatherless boy a, a gift and, and I took full advantage of it yeah so um that goes right into my next question about sports, and I know sports was a big part of your life, um, starting with Little League. So what what did Little League do for your life, um, 
as far as taking you to a new place other than that father was home and getting you out of the house and it didn't make me a better athlete you know i enjoyed it, it kept me uh um where i knew where mom knew where i was going to be you know she knew i was going to be at the park she knew i was going to be at the practice but most importantly were the coaches on in my little league field they took care of me as a as a kid and they knew that uh, my dad wasn't around and so they took me under their wing gave me a ride to practice gave me a ride home made me do my homework at their house you know et cetera. and i can you know i give them all the credit and i still do to this day whenever i see them yeah. give them all the credit for taking care of me as a youth that's awesome that's awesome and from that you went from little league to high school football and high school sports in general and what what was that like? What was what was your high school sports career like? Well, let me I can give it to you this way. It's kind of like you know I went I was in the Birmingham City School System and we didn't have middle school football, so I went from little league to high school. Yeah. Didn't know anybody. I went to Midfield High School because Midfield was not a Birmingham City School, so I went to Midfield High School and didn't know a soul. Yeah. You know, but it was a better school than where I was supposed to go. Yeah. So I went to Midfield High School and uh, uh, got in there and went from little league to starting quarterback as my sophomore year and, and uh, all the way up to my senior year. So it was pretty amazing to, to just play Little League football and not have any experience but jump in and, and be the starting quarterback as a 16-year-old. Yeah, and um, I know your high school football coach was a big, you know, almost father figure in your life, so tell me a little bit about him. Coach Sparks was a great man. He didn't know everybody's name, so he called everybody babe. If he walked into this door today, he'd call you babe because he didn't know your name. But Coach Sparks was a huge influence on my life, and I didn't ever want to let him down. He was a guy that I did not want to let down. And boy, when I did, it killed me. Uh, and Coach Sparks and I are dear friends to this day. Uh, but he's a wonderful man and, and, and patted me on my back when I needed it and also patted me on the butt when I needed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Literally patted me on the butt. Yeah, well, tell me that's Three licks or three days. Whenever you got in trouble, Coach Sparks, you go into his office, he said, you want three licks or three days? And he knew us athletes were going to, we, we, we athletes were going to uh, say three licks, and he popped us good. I mean, and then we walked out the door, he said, what are you supposed to say? And we had to say, thank you, Coach Sparks. So, Man. Yeah. Wish they'd do that to y'all today. I don't. I did. I want to watch it. No. No, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so yeah, high school, high school football, but... Um, what were you like in high school, just in general? What was your experience like? Being the new guy there, you know, not knowing everybody, it kind of wound up really good for me. Um, uh, I, my grades weren't as good as they needed to be, uh, but I had a, a great life. School wasn't too far away. We went to float meetings. You know, you had course dates and you, after football games, and we went to Pizza Hut on Thursday nights before the football games. Uh, the school was great. I had perfect attendance for four days. Yes, I had perfect attendance for four days. I mean, for, for four years, excuse me, four years. Uh, didn't miss a day of school in four years. They That's said nice. if you have good grades or you have perfect attendance, you don't have to take your exams. So I knew what I was going to do on my exams, so I had perfect yeah. attendance, so I didn't have to take any of my exams. That's crazy. That's crazy. And, um, yeah, so obviously you go you go into college, and what was, what was the transition like from high school to college? I got a scholarship to Livingston University, which is now the University of West Alabama, and that was a huge thing for me because you have, I went from one high school coach who uh, was faith-based and faith-founded and, and, and this, that, and the other, and never said a cuss word to a, to a, another area where they just said every cuss word in the book at you. Uh, and it wasn't a great experience for me. But then in that following semester, I transferred to Sanford and, and played football when uh, Coach Bowden came in 1987. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, I know your roommate in college was Jimbo Fisher, so tell me about How do you know that? A little bit. Because you're my dad. Okay. And sure, you've said it quite a few. That's right. Times Jimbo was me. my was my roommate on road trips during football season, and uh, his nickname was Buckethead. He had such a big head, we had to get a separate helmet for him. But uh, if he walked in the door like today, we'd say, "Hey, Bucket," and he know who who we're talking about. And that was his nickname. So there's a lot of stories that I can't tell you, high school students, but uh, just to know that Jimbo's a great guy and a great coach, and uh, uh, it was exciting to be a, be a, be his roommate. Yeah, that's really cool. And. Um, Right out of college, um, it seems like you went and moved up to Nashville to start a country music career. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like, that transition and then, you know? It's kind of like that. you walking out that door and moving to Nashville without any money or not knowing anybody. How would you feel? Pretty scary. It'd be pretty scary, wouldn't it? Yeah. That was what it was for me when I graduated from Sanford. A month later, I moved to Nashville. 
just a tad of money, didn't know anybody, didn't have a place to live, didn't know, didn't have a job or anything, but I knew that God led me up there to go up there and sing, so I moved up there and sang and did it for nine years and opened it up for the legends like George Jones and Merle Haggard and, and folks like that and singing at one of the most famous places in Nashville that everybody wants to go to, and that's Tootsie's. And uh, did that for eight or nine years and had some great experiences meeting and going to Loretta Lynn's house, Tammy Wynette's house, uh, sitting beside Garth Brooks and Alan Jackson at a, at a songwriter's award show. That was just an amazing event. So all those little things I don't tell a lot of people because nobody believes me in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so you sang, you sang country music uh, for nine years. What, what caused you to sort of decide that you want to go into singing? Well, that goes back to when my father left in 1975. I'd go sit on our front of our on our curb out front in the front yard, uh, and I'd just sing songs. You know, I didn't care what it was, whether it was Chris Christopherson or or Glenn Campbell or or whoever it was. I'd just sit there and sing songs, and I thought that the people across the street, the neighbors, would, call, would walk out the door and start clapping for me. And uh, of course, that never happened, but uh, it that taught me how to sing. My father, due to alcoholism. Uh, left us, but he was also a quartet singer back in the 60s and, and was a pretty good singer, so uh, therefore you get your vocals from that side of the family. Yeah. Um, so I would sit there on the curb and sing and sing and sing, and next thing I know, uh, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee at Tammy Wynette's house. <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, man. Um, so yeah, and then you went from Nashville. Um, to Texas, where I was born, and then um, you sort of found a career in sports. Um, so tell me about that. I know, obviously, it came from your childhood in sports, I think, yeah. that. But uh, My life has been sports, really. That's what it has. I'm not a dumb job because I've paid for three educations because of it. Yeah. My education, my your older brother and sister, you know, I was in sports involved in a sports management position. I was also the state director for the Governor's Commission on Physical Fitness and Sports. So all those things led to college education. So I don't consider that a dumb jock. How about you? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. And so, but I moved to Dallas uh, from Nashville to sing at a place called Cowboys down there in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, in front of 4,000 people every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. And after about a few months, God said, I got something else planned for you. You're going you're gonna to leave here and we're going to go find you another job. And next thing you know, I'm uh, coaching high school football in Frisco, Texas at Frisco High School. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, you went from there to what What came after that? Just from Frisco, I coached football, football and baseball. And then there was this new private school opened up in, in Frisco, Texas called Legacy Christian Academy. Yeah. And uh, they didn't have an athletic program or a physical education program or anything like that. So that next year, I moved over there and st helped start their physical education program and, and got them involved with the, the President's Challenge program and, and helped with their... Um, uh, sports teams and and things now legacy is one of the largest uh, private schools in North Texas it's really cool yeah. it's really cool and then we proceeded to I say we because I'm in the picture uh, you're now. just trying to speak French but go ahead <laughs> and um, so we moved to Alabama and um, you got a job at was it Birmingham Athletic Partnership I did, yeah. yeah so uh, so tell me about, about what you did there and what y'all's mission was. Again, it's another sports-related field. Uh, God put me here back in Birmingham. I was a Birmingham City School product, and I wanted to come back home and, and help out the Birmingham City Schools programs. And uh, Mr. Edgar Weldon founded an organization called the Birmingham Athletic Partnership, and I became their executive director. And my job was to go help the Birmingham City High Schools with their band and athletic and cheerleading programs if they needed a volleyball uh, uniform, I bought it for them. If they needed soccer goals, I bought it for them. If they needed cheerleading outfits, we bought it for them. If they needed trumpets or drums or whatever it was, because these kids did not have that. The Birmingham City Schools budget could not afford. You know, they probably at the most had three or four thousand dollars in their budget at each school. Mm. Uh, so we went out and raised money, and 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 we I went out and purchased everything from footballs to help folks like Chris Davis, the guy who ran the kickoff back. I mean the Phil go back against Alabama to Marcel Doris, who now was one of the highest play, paid NFL players in history, Casanova McKenzie and things like that, go to camps that they couldn't afford to go to. Yeah. And so the Birmingham Athletic Partnership helped those folks do that, and the rest is history. So we were able to do things, and I was there for seven years, and we raised about $2.5 million to help those programs. I'm still friends with those some of those kids today. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of money, $2 million. Man. 
Um, <clears throat> and then you went you went from that to governor's convention, which you which you mentioned. And um, now that brings us to where we are today. Yep. And um, right here. Right, right here. <laughs> and no, I'm not sitting on your lap. <laughs> um, so yeah, I know. Obviously, I want to talk about your um, your wreck last year from your mountain biking accident. Um, so just just give us a recap on what happened exactly. Monday night, August the sixth of 2018, I went out riding my bike to uh, you know for a short trail ride, and then I was going to go head over to the high school football stadium and do stadium steps and uh so it was just an easy ride on the newest trail out there and, and you know you could i could ride it backwards without a hand without putting my hands on the handlebars most of the time and I got about 90 yards away from the trail and this was about 5 30 in the evening time and uh about you know 90 yards away from the halfway mark to turn around and go back to where my car was and something happened i don't know what happened i don't remember anything but uh a 17 year old kid was fishing on the bank of the lake and uh, he said he heard me uh you know crying for help but he said mr best your spinal cord had already swollen into your esophagus probably and you, were, you sounded like a duck to crying for help so i guess i laid there for 15 20 minutes or so maybe more than that and he called 911 and he said uh you know we have a man down and his face is in the dirt and his, you know it looks like he can't hardly breathe and and uh, she said, we may want to move him off the trail because there's other mountain bikers coming and they may run over him. And he, he said, a 17-year-old kid now who never fished on the bank of Oak Mountain State Park in his life said, ma'am, my mother's a spinal cord surgeon, I mean a spinal cord specialist, and I was taught not to move anybody. And uh, so for you folks out here who are watching this today, uh, his mother was Christopher Reeves' spinal cord specialist. Yeah. Uh, when Christopher Reeves had that bad horse ride. Everybody knows who Christopher Reeves, Reeves is. If you don't, he's the Superman of the 80s. Uh, and so, you know, I felt like God put Graham Alexander, the young man in my life, and saved my life in 30 seconds. Got to the hospital, the doctor said, well, you'll be here for two months, Mr. Best, and you probably won't walk out of here. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, you got me for a month, Doc, and I'm walking out of here, and God let us walk out of there in three and a half weeks. Um, I don't have any feeling in my below my knees to in my feet or below my elbows to my hands, but uh, I'm just like you. I can walk around, do everything in the world. I just don't have any feeling in everything, but we count it all joy. Yeah. That's awesome. I remember that day at Chick-fil-A, I didn't know you were coming home, and you just came up by me. And yep. And I didn't, didn't Look, even know you were. You were on the drive through and, and, the, and I told the, the doc that kept coming in my room last week i said i'm leaving thursday so you can do whatever you want to do but i'm, I'm leaving you're not doing anything but checking my blood pressure because you thought i was gonna come on on sunday or monday and so she let me out on thursday and the first thing i wanted to do was come to chick-fil-a and, and see you and your mom helped me up on the walk up there and uh, looked over at you and said hey and you came running over there and so it was an exciting event it made me want to get out of the hospital come see see you and the rest of my family so it was a, a, a great opportunity to yeah. to get out of there and yeah. I go back to see those people today I still go back to the day see my nurses and my physical therapists and I walk in there and surprise them uh, and they're just thrilled to death to see me so uh, yeah. we're not discouraged or whatever there's things that happen in this world and you just kind of go with it and no need to get depressed because God's got something better for you for sure for sure um, and yeah can I, just, I not be can I quit being serious now can I like be me can you be you yeah. like like funny you yeah I, I mean, guess so yeah, it's like okay sure. good I just want to uh, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah let's let's get out of that that yeah. gloomy area no um it wasn't it wasn't really a sad time it was, no, it, was, it was it was a good time um and I I don't really know how to go about talking about this subject but uh, just tell us about tell them about what your family is is like family life is like um without spared details involving me oh. <laughs> so i can't talk about you being scared to take the trash out at night listen it's dark yeah. we don't have a street light okay anyway well, I, won't, I won't share that then i've got a wonderful we've got a wonderful family billy's 28 year older brother and casey's uh 26 and she's a social worker at the y WCA in downtown Birmingham. Billy's a web designer and is a partner in an organization called The Nine in Tuscaloosa. And uh, Griffin, you've played sports for eight or ten years, from baseball to football to basketball to, to tennis. Instead of playing tennis out there practicing, you used it like, you're play, like you were, you know, the lead guitar player for Van Halen. I remember that. You know, and uh, I've got a photo of that just in case they want to see that. But uh, you've been a great kid, changing from athletics into the uh, art field uh just like i did from sports to being a 
music artist, and the same thing with you. And we're we're proud of what you've done, and and my mom, you know mom is is proud. The whole family's proud. So uh, we've got a pretty good family. Uh, we I told you guys when I moved back to Birmingham with you guys, we're not moving up the school system. So you've been you've been in the school since kindergarten and all up to graduate. Hopefully by hopefully May, this May you'll graduate. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and so. Um, Tell a little about a bit about mom. I mean, yeah, yeah. Just you know, James Spann got two segments, so this better be three segments. It's it's going on to be a long uh, interview. Sure you're, you're killing it James so and far. I friends, and I want to make sure James, you know, I beat him this time. <laughs> you Finally, wanna, you have a longer interview. You know, <laughs> yes. Mom's wonderful. Her name is Diana, and uh, she was a paralegal for over 25 years. Grew up in Texas. Uh, she. Uh, uh, we went. We found out she had breast cancer in 2016, and so we got that taken care of after 14 surgeries mm -hmm. uh, of cancer uh, treatment. Uh, 14 surgeries. So she decided to go downstairs one day when I told her not to go. You know, get out of the bed because you know she was hurting, and she went downstairs. And she's always been crafty, so she made this bot. Uh, looks like a robot, uh, and from then on, she left her paralegal position, and for the last two and a half years she's been a professional artist that travels all, all over the country uh, selling her art and meeting great great people and, and doing an outstanding job so we're very proud of Diane and what she's done uh, as an artist and you can go to junkyardbots.com and see all of her work and she's made over 50 500 bots and all, each and every one of them are different and she's gone to shows from the Hamptons in New York to Breckenridge, Colorado to Cape Canaveral, Florida yeah. with her and a Great Dane and a 1979 vintage RV trailer, right? I, I yeah. know about that. Yeah, so. for sure. Um, and yeah, so also tell tell us a little bit about my brother Billy, and my sister Casey. Billy's always a quiet one. Billy's uh, has always he could lived on his own at twelve years old. He was a great kid. Went to Oak Mountain High School here and uh, uh, wound up receiving over a million and a half dollars in scholarships. And the only person that beat him was uh, a kid named Davis Duchock who had full scholarships to Stanford, Vanderbilt, football scholarships and things like that. So Billy was behind him. Uh, just the greatest kid in the world. Went on a trip to Southeast Asia for three months on a mission trip that God called him to. And he went out there on his own by himself this past spring uh, for three months and then came back home and this last month or two ago took a, a group from Oak Mountain Presbyterian Church back over there for three weeks to Southeast Asia and, and so uh, God's got great things in store for him. Casey does an outstanding job with what she does as a social worker. She was an All-American lacrosse player here at Oak Mountain High School. They went to four state championships in a row. She started a lacrosse program uh, and, and things like that. So proud of her for being an athlete and, uh, and, and an artist. She's a great artist as well. But she loves serving those folks at the YWCA and helping the moms who are battered and the children who don't have a father, and, and she takes care of them. And I got to see it this past Saturday, so very, very proud of her. For sure, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I think I think we're, we're coming towards the end of, of our interview. Um, but you, you killed it. You killed it. Um, and we're just going to, real quick, I want to talk about um, some of the just we're gonna go back to the wreck real quick. We're getting back into the gloomy stuff, but um, make fun of me all you want to, Griffin. I can take it. <laughs> just real quick, talk about um, some of the difficulties you've had to overcome. Uh, you know what it's like to button your shirt. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to button my shirt. Yeah. You know, um, it's hard for me to tie shoes. Uh, it's hard to do things like that. Pick up forks or pick up knives and they slip out of your hands or pick up your iPhone and hold on to it. You don't know if you're holding it tight or if you're holding it loose and it slips out or your glasses or, or, or a cup or whatever it is. Whatever, but sometimes the things just slide through my hands because I can't yeah. feel it. I don't know how tight I'm holding them. But as you can see, you know, I have movable parts. I just can't feel anything. It doesn't burn. It doesn't sting. It doesn't do anything, but it's just numb. Yeah. yeah, but that's okay. And I can still take you anytime. It'll it'll come back. Oh wow! I right. think I can. I think I can. Oh, hold we'll, my we'll, we'll take care of that tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for watching. If you'd like to follow the Addiction Prevention Coalition on Instagram, it's I. You know what? We'll pop it down below. It's gonna be. It's it's too long to spell. Um, thank you guys for watching.